Good morning, everyone, and th- welcome to our Thanksgiving service on this beautiful Sunday. I remind you that on the 2nd of November, we have our circuit quarterly meeting, and that will be at half past six at Brentwood Methodist Church. You will also find the lectionary readings on uh, the bulletin as it was emailed to you. And if you, for some reason, have not received a digital copy of the bulletin, please contact Anz so that she may add or correct your email address and ensure that you do uh, receive a copy every week. There's a list of prayer needs on the bulletin, and uh, we uplift those people in prayer and ask that you also join us in that. And then a reminder that we are urgently in need of the donation of dry and tinned food for the needy, and this can be dropped off at the church on Fridays between 8 and 3. Birthdays this week... Jacques de Busson, Laurie Robenheimer, Macy Netteville, and Irene van der Walt. Then Children's Church, uh, there is the Hilton Methodist Junior Youth Club, Fridays from 5 to 6, and we encourage you to register online and to, to come and attend that. And I'm talking about your children. Uh, then access to the link under Sermons on the Hilton Methodist website. And then the youth as well. They have a Friday night uh, high school youth, and it seems to be really growing. So please, if your child is in high school, then uh, contact Charles and have them attend. It will not be a waste of time. I pray that you will truly be blessed in the service. Good morning, everyone. The call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. Let us pray. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen. Come, let's sing to the rock of ages, worship him, joyful and contagious. Bring a song of glory to our God. Come, let's bow, kneel before our maker, praise him, there's his own greater. Bring a song of glory to our God. The heavens raise him and his people cry. Oh, the Lord our God is great, our God is King of all the earth. Raise a shout, let praise ring out. Our God is King. Joyful and contagious, bring a song of glory to our God. Come, let's bow, kneel before our Maker, praise Him now, there is no greater. Bring a song of glory to our God. He made the earth, 
oceans wide, the desert lands, the mountains heights, the heavens brazen, and its people confession. Let us pray. Let us come before God to bring our confession to him who is more than willing and able to touch and forgive us for the wrongs we have committed. Things said in haste, our self-centeredness, our slowness to reach out, our contentment with living a go-it-alone lifestyle to the detriment of ourselves and Christ's body, the church, of which we are a part. Let's spend a moment in silence as we bring our thoughts to God, our Father, in Jesus' name. And in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 51 verses 1 to 7, we declare and say, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet... You desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you, Lord, for your touch. Amen. Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat This covenant is making me whole So I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean 
Purify my heart in your presence Teach me to discover the joy Of holiness that forms as you draw me close In you what was lost is restored So I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean So I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Our readings today are from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, and verses 16 and 18. Now, brothers... About times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so on this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but rather to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Our second reading is Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me, he is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand has lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness, 
I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows and hands, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to our Thanksgiving service. And we truly have reason to be thankful. God has blessed us abundantly as a church and as individuals. And it is evident in our lives. It's evident in our church. It's evident in our community. We are a blessed people. And today's text is going to challenge the way we normally think about God's will. I think our text suggests that when we ask, what is God's will for my life? We should put less emphasis on what does God want me to do and more on the question, what does God want me to be? In our reading from 1 Thessalonians, we find that what some would call the standing orders of the church. And if you want to know what God's will is for your life, well, here's a good place to start. And Paul instructed us on our interpersonal relationships. And in these verses, he talks to us about our attitudes. And he says, be joyful always, pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, each of these commands is given in the imperative, which means these are commands, not advice or suggestions or, well, maybe if you don't mind and you have the time, would you please? Paul is not really talking about our feelings. For the most part, we can't control our feelings. Paul is addressing our mindset, our focus. And these three commands are not difficult to understand. In fact, they're, they're quite simple. We know that God wants us to be joyful and praying and filled with thanksgiving. However, the, the modifiers of each directive is what makes these commands difficult. We are to be always thankful, continually praying and thankful in all circumstances. And that's what makes it difficult. To be joyful always, we need to understand, Paul is not telling us that we should be happy all the time. That would just be foolish. There are many things in life that bring about unhappiness. Circumstances can bring sadness and grief and a sense of bewilderment. I don't believe Paul is telling us to simply put on a happy face. God doesn't want us to be false. He wants us to be real. Sometimes we just don't feel happy. But joy is much deeper than happiness. It is unrelated to the circumstances of life and it's anchored in our relationship with God. It is that exhilaration of spirit that derives from our deep-seated confidence in God's love, His power and His work in our lives. The deeper our roots extend in our relationship with God, the more joy we will know. So to state the obvious, if you don't have a true and vital relationship with God, you will not know this kind of joy. The prerequisite to joy is a true and vital relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In other words, if you are still putting your confidence in your own abilities, if you think you can do it on your own, if your faith is more of an academic issue than a vital relationship in your life, you will not know or find this kind of joy. I remember going deep sea fishing with my son, Jock, and it was quite an experience. We had a fantastic time going out in the boat, but it quickly changed once we stopped and dropped anchor. Because then the, the effect of the waves really took hold of us. And it wasn't long before we could feel the seasickness coming on. And pretty soon, my son was very ill and he eventually ended up in a fetal position in the back of the boat. 
I wasn't as badly affected. But I can tell you that every time I looked down into the boat, I could feel the nausea increasing. And I had to look over the horizon. I had to look for the top of the, the shoreline, the very top of the, the high-rise edges of the shoreline that I could still see eight kilometers away. And as long as I, I kept them in my, my sight, if, even if it was peripherally, if I kept them in my sight, I was okay. But the minute I looked down, I wasn't anymore. So I ended up baiting the hook up here rather than here in front of me. I raised it high so I could keep an eye on what was stability. As long as I keep my eyes on what, were, what offered stability, I was fine. The moment I looked down, not so much. The motion of a boat confuses our balance system. And when we look at the very object that is causing our movement, that just increases. But we can handle the ups and downs if we have our eyes fixed on an object that is unmoved by our own bobbing and weaving. And this is how we experience joy. We cannot focus on the circumstances of life, or life will make us sick. We will be joyful sometimes, but often we will find joy lacking. We must instead put our focus on something that is constant. And that constant is the nature, the character, and the promise of God. We should focus on God's righteous character, Christ's redemptive work, the Holy Spirit's ministry on our behalf, the spiritual blessings we possess, God's providence as He orchestrates everything for our benefit, the promise of future glory, answered prayer, the gift of God's word, deep and sincere relationships in the body of Christ, the privilege of being able to share the life-changing message of the gospel with others. Do you notice something about this list? These are generally not the things that we think of as key to our joy. We would list things like good health and family, job satisfaction, great experiences and personal achievements. But our focus is on the storm-tossed circumstances rather than the stable character of God. And because of that, we often miss out on joy because we try to create it ourselves. When we try to produce joy, we're working against joy. You see, when we look to our activities and our devices to bring us joy, we're not looking at the Lord. When we are relying on external things, we are distracted from the internal work of the Holy Spirit. The harder we work to find joy, the further we drift from the Lord and that joy that we are actually looking for. And then Paul says we need to pray continually. Or as King James' version puts it, pray without ceasing. Now that sounds very difficult. And to most this would sound like an exaggeration. If anyone prayed all the time, they would actually be quite useless in the world. They would not be able to function. But Paul does not mean that we should constantly spend our lives in a prayer meeting or in formal prayer. He isn't saying we should always be on our knees with our eyes closed and our hands raised. That's only one kind of prayer. Paul is encouraging us to be in constant communication with God. And most of us would actually have a better time with prayer if we kept up a running conversation with the Lord throughout the day. When we talk about communication and marriage, we are not simply talking about those times when we sit down to have formal conversations with our spouse. Communication in marriage takes place constantly. We communicate through our words, our actions, and even through our silences. Have you noticed that people who have been married a while often start finishing one another's sentences? And many times something will be said and they have exactly the same response. A conversation is progressing and all of a sudden both start talking about something totally unrelated. And why is that? Well, because they've shared their lives with one another to such a degree that they've begun to think alike. And wouldn't it be great if we had that kind of relationship with God? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have such a continuing conversation with the Lord that you actually knew what God wanted you to do without even having to ask? Wouldn't it be great if you could hear his voice of love in your head in every crisis? 
People wonder, what in the world would I talk to God about all day long? And again, we have to adjust our thinking. We think of prayer as talking to God or asking God for stuff. Prayer is much more than merely making requests. Prayer is meant to be a conversation with the Lord. It's a time for us to align our hearts and minds with His. And there are times when we need to confess our sin. Times when we can express appreciation for God's creative wonders and the beauty of nature that surrounds us. Times we should express our love. and Times we should admit our fears and our doubts and seek His guidance. And there are times when we should be giving thanks, like today. To pray without ceasing means we are living and thinking in the presence of God. And then Paul says that we need to give thanks in all circumstances. Once again, we need to understand what he means. Paul is not saying we should give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Obviously, we should not be thankful for injustice or tragedy, disease or war. None of these things are good. However, we are to be grateful in every circumstance. And this is an important distinction. You see, like joy, our thankfulness is anchored to our relationship in Christ, rather than to the circumstances of life. No matter what happens in life, we can be grateful that we are forgiven and loved in Christ. We can be grateful that nothing can separate us from God's love. That God is working in every circumstance for our good, even in the circumstances that aren't good in and of themselves. We can be thankful that God will supply our needs, that He will give us the strength that we need. We can be thankful that we will live in though, in though we die. And if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have an eternal house in heaven not made by human hands. No one can snatch us from His hand. We can be thankful that God will finish the work that He has started in our lives. And we can be thankful that we have been extended mercy rather than justice. And if we get this, if we understand the implications of these truths, then we will be able to be grateful in every circumstance. No matter what happens, we can still be grateful that we have not been treated as we have, been, as we have deserved, but have been treated with mercy and the love of God. I've spoken to people who have lost their home in a fire. And their response was, we lost everything, but we're so thankful that no one was hurt. That's giving thanks in very difficult circumstances. We ought not only to thank God in the hard times, but we should also thank God and be grateful in the good times. In the hard times, we are forced to our knees and we recognize our lack of strength. So we turn to the Lord. And in good times... We tend to have a tendency to feel that we have somehow earned what we have. I see that. I most often get called to assist families in crises, to walk alongside them through valleys of loss and grief, valleys of pain and loneliness and desolation. But when there's celebration, that's when we, we kind of forget about God. We tend to pat each other with ourselves on the back. We forget to give thanks. Every day is a life gift. Every blessing is an expression of the mercy and love of God. And the point is this, if we focus on the circumstances of life, we will become moaners and grumblers. If we focus on the Lord, we will be thankers. No one promised that life would be easy. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, in the world you will have tribulation. But then Jesus adds, but I have overcome the world. That's the perspective that leads to a continually grateful heart. I struggle with these commands. Very often I find myself swallowed up by complaints rather than gratitude. Most recently, obviously load shedding has plummeted my soul into the depths of despair. <laughs> A sour mood rather than an attitude of deep-seated joy. I admit that at times I've had to remind myself to talk with God. But what Paul commands of us, what God desires from us, is not unreasonable and certainly not impossible. We must stop looking at these verses as if they are some exaggerations. 
we can be joyful always and pray without ceasing and we can always be grateful. It all depends on our relationship with God. So it's time for us to get serious and be honest with ourselves. We lack joy because we lose sight of God. We can become lax in our prayerfulness because we think too highly of ourselves. We find gratitude elusive because we have put our focus in the wrong place. We must remember that doing the will of God starts by being the person God has called us to be. If you want to do His will, the place to start is to develop an intimate relationship with Him. The thing about these commands is, if you really start working on one, the others tend to follow. If we find our joy in the Lord in all circumstances, we will want to talk with Him and we will be grateful. If we adopt an attitude of gratitude, we will find ourselves giving thanks in all, at times. And our attitude will, and outlook will be one of joy. If we learn to pray without ceasing, we will find the joy of our relationship with God. And we will find that it will overshadow the, the trials of our lives. And it will lead us to a constant sense of gratefulness. These commands are not unrealistic. So start somewhere. Each one of us can do these things, and if we would work on these areas of our life, we would find that our Lord will become more precious. The trials of life would be less devastating, and we would be, have a, have, be having a lot of more fun, and we'd be more fun to have around as well. So if you want to know what the will of God is for your life, start here. Today, right now, my heart is grateful. I'm grateful because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is here and He is present with us. I know that His love can never be shaken. I know that He will never leave us. I know that my life of gratitude, which shows up in the way I use my time, is not a task I need to accomplish on my religion checklist. No. My life of gratitude is a response of thanksgiving to God for all that He's already done for us, for all that He continues to do for us, and for all the ways in which He's been present with us in the past, and all the ways that He continues to be present with us right now. What are you grateful for today? Talk to God about that. Sit down with Him. Tell Him how thankful you are. Maybe even spend some comfortable, silent time with Him giving Him the opportunity to speak to you. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank You. We glorify Your holy name. You have loved us as part of the world so much that You have given us Your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we need not die but can have eternal life because we have accepted and embraced Him as our Lord and Savior. And we thank You that He did not come to condemn us, but to give us life, and life in abundance. And we can see that life in our church and in the individuals that make up this church. This church that You have planted on the corners of Mimosa and Elizabeth for your glory and for your purpose. And we thank you, Lord, for everyone who has worshipped here, everyone who has made this what it is, everyone who has contributed and committed themselves. And we thank you that we know that this remains your church. And we are but custodians, temporary, meant to be of passing nature. That in this church you are the only constant. And as long as we look to you, not to one another, not to our resources, not to our past, our present or our future, as we would have it or as we could make it or control it, but if we keep our eyes on you, we will have joy, we will have hope, and we will know that the church is in safe hands. 
We thank you that this is a sanctuary, a place of healing, a place, Lord, of worship, a place of fellowship, a place of acceptance. And we pray that you would help each one of us to continue making it so, increasingly more, day by day. We thank you that every time we arrive, we find you present. And when we leave, you go with us. We thank you that you are constant in our lives. We thank you that you are constant in the lives of our families, our members, and the life of our church. Help us to be constantly thankful, joyful, and prayerful. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Die genade van onze Heer Jezus Christus, die liefde van God en die gemeenschap van die Heilige Geest met ons wees, nou en verewig. Amen.